a hiker found a skull in the woods in the general area, so we cordoned off the area and began looking for any kind of evidence we could. We found a pan in the area, perhaps used to bring body parts in. We also found a bunch of holes indicating that someone had been digging in the area, perhaps trying to hide evidence. We also found a bunch of underwear, suggesting that the victim was female. So we brought in a backhoe and began excavating the area more. We also found bags, perhaps used to wrap body parts in, and a purse. We opened it up and we found it was made in China. This was our first real lead. We put it all together and we came up with a scenario. Hey Joe, what's going on? Yeah, I just got that video. I'm about to pop it into the VCR right now. Yeah, well, tomorrow we'll know how to do a facial reconstruction. Yeah, okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Dahmer. And I'm Dr. Bundy. Today on Mary Does Monkeys, we're going to be learning about facial reconstruction. What are facial reconstructions, you may ask? Facial reconstructions are done with the purpose of identification. Identifications can be made based on morphological similarities between the skull and an individual. Before one can start an act, the actual reconstruction of the cranium, the skull must first be analyzed. The final outcome of a reconstruction is dependent on what the forensic anthropologist finds for ethnic affiliation, age, and sex. This is because tissue thicknesses differ between races and sex. After determining these attributes, the skull tissue markers are created to give the forensic artist a guide by which to mold the clay to. Dr. Bundy will tell us about that. Tissue markers can be made using erasers, toothpicks, and other similar materials. A miter box and X-Acto knife help with accurately cutting tissue markers. We used electric eraser erasers. <laughs> Dr. Bunny, that sounds awfully funny. Our electric eraser eraser. The finished tissue markers can then be adhered to the skull using rubber cement or other glues that aren't permanent. The markers are adhered according to the diagram. At this point, it might be a good idea to take photos of your work for use in photographic superimposition. Photographic superimposition is just what it sounds like. It is superimposing an image of an individual on top of an image of a skull. The purpose of photo superimposition is to match the skull to the face for identification purposes. In order to make accurate correlations between a skull and a face, both need to be the same size. The way in which the photos are angled are important as well. Images must be angled the same for correlations to be made accurately. 
Facial landmarks are then compared. These are the distinguishing factors associated with the skull that make up the skull morphology, such as facial, mandibular, and nasal aperture dimensions. These are just a few of many. Wow, that's kind of complicated but neat. Can we talk about something I understand now? Okay, let's get back to reconstruction then. Unless you have access to prosthetic eyes, clay is rolled up into a sphere and inserted into the eye orbit with cotton backing. Next, we get to play with play connect the dots with strips of clay equal in depth to the corresponding marker. Once all markers have been connected, the spaces in between are filled and smooth. Another way to connect the tissue markers is by following the underlying musculature of the face. This anatomical sensitivity requires an expert in human anatomy, but the outcome is more accurate and realistic than the Pinocchio you would have created just laying the clay on top of the tissue markers. The nose is probably one of the harder features to reconstruct on the face. It's ba a basic guide is created using a toothpick extending from the ethmoid at the same angle as the most distal portion of that bone. The same principle is applied to the nasal spine. When the two meet in between is the basic size of the nose. Ears come down to an artist's intuition. There are no skeletal vestiges on the cranium that give the artist an idea of shape. But who the hell notices ears anyway? Other important details are mouth and eyes. It is best, if possible, to give the facial reconstruction a smile, due to smiles being distinctive to the individual. If teeth are absent, then it's probably best not to create a smile. The smile usually extends from canine to canine and upward to the cemento, enamel, or CE junction, aka the gum line. And that's about all there is to it, I think. So, Dr. Dahmer, what do you think the next step for facial reconstruction is? Well, with technology increasing exponentially, forensic artists are beginning to feel the pressure of computers in their field. Despite the cynics, use of computers for facial reconstruction seems to be a logical next step. With the use of computers, complex textures can be applied along with skin tones, ears, and hairstyles, all at a fraction of the time it takes a forensic artist. With three-dimensional scanners, skulls can be scanned into computers and their attributes compared to databases of individuals based on empirical data collected from thousands of people. This will allow quick analysis of racial affiliation and sex. Missing individuals can also be entered into a database and their pictures and physical characteristics compared instantaneously to skeletal remains based on facial landmarks. So that's about all the time we have for this episode, folks. What are we going to learn next time on Mary Does Monkeys? We'll look at mating rituals between primatologists and their animals. Be here next week. Same monkey time. Same monkey place. It's a dead man's party.